this is so this is interview number four. <laughs> yes, it there, is. I thought there would only be interview number one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> clearly, clearly we have a lot to talk about. Um, and so today we're continuing with our conversation about leadership and your role, particularly within the International Paralympic Committee. We had talked about um, your leadership within the academic community in a couple, one of our earlier iterations and specifically at the University of Alberta and, you know, your involvement with some international federations and on the research side. And, you know, then we have talked a little bit about your leadership just within the university itself as an institution and some of the other more Alberta focused, Canadian focused initiatives outside of Paralympic sport. But sure. for the last bit anyways, we're going to focus on this Paralympic sport. Now what's fascinating from my perspective, on this conversation is this is actually when I knew you, um, where we're going to pick up. Yep. So we're going to start in and around 1994, um, which was when the Paralympics were held in Lillehammer. And so those are the first winter Paralympic games under the auspices, if I recall correctly, of the IPC. Um, or no, I guess, I guess. No, 92. Yeah. Yeah. Under yeah. the auspices there too. The Paralympic games would have taken place in Barcelona. And then we were leading up to the games in Atlanta and where we finished um, at our last uh, conversation was we were talking about the logos um, of the mm -hmm. IPC. And so in Seoul, the uh, the logos were the five Ajitos. Yeah, um, uh, Tegooks. Tegooks, Tegooks, that's Tegooks. right. Yeah. Which looked like, I guess in some respects, the five Olympic rings. Correct. Uh, similar, similar pattern to that. And I want you to start your start start our conversation today with talking a little bit about your leadership of the Paralympic movement and in dealing with conflict, perhaps, and in particular, you know, managing that relationship with the IOC and in particular as it relates to the logo. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting. I mean, we can certainly sort of focus on that early 90s aspect, but just one element that I think was really uh, important to the history of IPC up until remember 1980 other than two Stoke games in in um, Italy and in Tokyo none of the games after that were in any Olympic cities at all and in fact the reason why I started looking at the uh, new structure and governance for international sport for a new body was not only because I wasn't satisfied or happy with the I, ICC and, and how they were managing activities, but really what that hit, when that hit home was in 1984, when all of a sudden the games got split. Uh, the wheelchair games went from Illinois back over to London and the other disabilities went to um, uh, went to New York, and that's why it further illustrated how we had to create an organization built on sport, not disability, and why there had to be uh, national Paralympic committees and not the ICC. So I just wanted to throw that in because that was a crucial. That was really crucial, and that really uh, that really energized me to say I've really got to get this paper around the world to look at those changes. Okay. But then after IPC was created, I mean, we had tremendous challenges ahead of us. One, we had to find a way of, it, of including and satisfying the IOSDs because right. they could... Been dis they, like, they, because they had been disenfranchised in some respect, right? Like they had been... They, absolutely. And, and they are now. And, and again, there's, there's no reason for them to exist because there are no games that are specifically right. designed for uh, a disability. Uh, so we had to deal with that. Uh, we had to deal with the development of a new constitution and bylaws. We had to look at finding um, uh, a new home for IPC and getting more of a permanent headquarters. We had to develop a working relationship with the IOC and to fit within their mandate and to build a relationship and trust with the IOC. And that was uh, one of my greater challenges is to, uh, and I was very, we were very fortunate that Samaranch 
was the president at the time of IOC because he was very supportive of the IPC and the creation of one organization representing all disability and all sport. Uh, and so that's why he was quite anxious to continue with the support of the IPC. However, then we had our first conflict, so to speak, with our relationship when it was brought to our attention. Uh, I think it was by uh, Walter Troiger, who was our liaison person, and also the, uh, uh, the sport director uh, uh, for the IOC as well, that uh, initially the British Olympic Committee was not very happy with our logo that we'd already had in, in 88. Uh, and this was now in 1993 that, uh, that they felt that our logo was too similar to the Olympic logo and it was preventing the British Olympic Committee from being able to market, secure and attract sponsorships and, and support. So what do we do? So uh, uh, I had great discussions with the IOC about it. Then I went back to my executive board and said, we can modify this in a small way that can be acceptable to both the IOC and the IPC. So that's when we changed it to from five to three uh, Tegooks. And it worked all right then because then our then sort of our theme, our reason for being of, of um, uh, fit in because we had three theme names which fit in with the three colors of the Tegook. So I, I think, you know, the spirit and, and all that uh, uh, took place. So we eventually changed that. It was, uh, it was tough at our General Assembly because some people felt that we... Um, we should not back down from the IOC, but then others said, look at, we won't be able to survive without the IOC if we want to continue having our, our games uh, at the same city uh, and just following the Olympic games. So it was a compromise, I think. Uh, we didn't totally give in and, and we certainly worked hard to maintain what we had. So that took place, and I and I think we were we were fine fine with that. And then all along that period of time, uh, I was developing that relationship with Samaranch, uh, so that we could eventually uh, develop the most important historical document in the history of the Paralympic movement, and that was the first uh, memorandum of understanding that took twelve years. 11 years to develop and was finally signed in September of 2000 at the Paralympic Games in Sydney, Australia. So, uh, and that, that was a key to our to our history. So, and just, uh, just as an update, so that was the initial memorandum of understanding and there's been several updates to it since then. Yes. And now it continues, I believe, until 2032. 32, correct. The The foundation of it is primarily that any city bidding to host an Olympic Games also hosts a Paralympic Games. And so that's right. Beijing would have been the first city to fall under that memorandum of understanding in 2000. Uh, yeah, that that would have been, uh, that's correct by mandate. Right. Uh, even though up until Beijing in 08, even right back as far as 88, where the modern Paralympics started, right. all of those cities and organizing committees were right. operating like they were under a mandated MOU. Right. So, and I guess what I'm kind of leading towards is, so you managed that process without a hammer. Yes. But totally. ultimately, by the end of your tenure as president, that hammer, if, 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 if you may, um, was in place. At the at the end of your tenure, that's um, correct. Yes, it so was. I, yeah. So I want to talk. So let so tell me about your impression then of, you know, what you needed to do as a leader in order to kind of stick handle the process that you said took eleven years. Yeah. With the IOC. So what, you know, what elements of your leadership do you think allowed ultimately that to to be? Well, separated? well, well. I I 
certainly the first thing as I've talked about it before is uh, developing a relationship of trust and respect. And, and um, so that so that you're you're referring to you and Sam Ranch right now is that that mainly because we were the two leaders that had to really hammer out this memorandum of understanding. We were the two that had to continue to work together with issues that may have come up from time to time in the two organizations. We were the two that had to discuss uh, the operational support, financial support from the IOC and the like. So it was very important that I develop that relationship uh, of trust and respect. And at the same time, re, uh, remind ourselves that we also had responsibilities within our own organizations. Uh, so those three things that trust, respect and responsibility uh, are very, have always been important aspects uh, of leadership uh, to me. And uh, as I said, uh, and what had happened during those 11 years is that uh, Sam Ranch, as president of IOC, was very good about including me in more and more and more IOC activities. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on a number of their commissions. Uh, I was, uh, when they had their, uh, the problem of, um, uh, of Salt Lake City back in 99, I was one of 24 people from around the world who were appointed on a special commission to investigate uh, the situation in, uh, in Salt Lake City and then to come up with a series of resolutions to look at changing the Olympic movement. Uh, he also included me in the, in, in the United Nations Commission that dealt with uh, peace and truce uh, along with himself, myself, and along with three former general, uh, uh, United Nations uh, general, what do they call them? Secretary. Secretary yes, of the United Nations. So uh, we worked on those. And, and then I was on a couple of other commissions uh, of um, management commissions for, uh, uh, for some of the games like Beijing, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. So it was, uh, it was then the relationship, I think, was the strongest aspect that I developed because I knew if I, didn't, if I didn't have his trust and respect, I had nothing. Right. Uh, and, I, and I think I was able to develop that because I did respect him. I did trust him. Uh, I did work hard. I, I mean, I didn't. Uh, I didn't give in to him because there were a number of things that we agreed to disagree and there were a number of things that that he couldn't or wouldn't do and I couldn't wouldn't do so there were those situations but in the overall theme of things it was uh, it was an it was an exceptionally good relationship uh, okay hey, uh, I, I want to pivot a little bit and talk about your leadership of the organization um, as a volunteer driven organization. So, so mm -hmm. Lee, I believe was a officially a staff person from the, from the beginning from 1989. Yes. If I recall. yes, she was, but you didn't have, you didn't have a, an office until 1999. I don't think. Um, yeah. We didn't have a headquarters, but we did have an office uh, in Belgium, mm -hmm. the former, or the first secretary general who was nominated and elected, uh, Andre Ross, oh, right. uh, was from Belgium, the same city as um, as Lean. So he had oh, he owned a, uh, uh, I guess, a condominium uh, that he converted into the office for the IPC. So uh, we did hire Lean to begin with part time and eventually became full-time. And if there were any costs associated with the uh, condo, we had to pay uh, rent for it and we had to pay the utilities. But that was basically about all, but it was owned by Andre Ross. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but I started right away, and not right away, but in about after talking with Sam Ranch at a time, he, 
he had indicated that uh, that if we looked at having a headquarters in Lausanne, it may not be in our best interest because it's not the easiest place to get into, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started looking for different cities around the world to see who would be prepared to bid mm -hmm. to host our uh, our general our um, our headquarters. And that's when, and that took, uh, you know, that took a good three, four, five years because it wasn't in place until 99. I think we made the decision in 97. So we, I would have started looking more in about 93, 94. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, and we I guess had 11 cities who initially expressed interest in being our headquarters. And I think we ended up with six or seven proposals from various cities around the world. Huh. I don't think I knew that. Yeah. Hey, I want you to talk. So the reason I asked the question is I, I want to try and go down the path of, so you did have staff, but I would have already, so one or two, you know, two. Um, yeah. This is, a, this is an international organization you're trying to run. Um, tell me about your the leadership that you needed or the style of leadership that you needed, particularly from a volunteer perspective and a global one at that? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I suppose, I guess that was our, our greatest challenge was how do we, how do we grow an organization if we've got an ambition to be one of the largest and strongest organization, sport organizations in the world, representing 200 or more countries it was going to be impossible to deal do that using volunteers only so uh once uh, lean was working for us full full time and we started to find a suitable location which was and still is in bonn germany um I had spoken to Sam Ranch a few times about that and, and some of his staff as to what they felt were the important aspects and features that would go into a, a, a headquarters. And, but I also recognize that we were a voluntary organization. Uh, my entire board were all volunteers. Uh, I mean, some of them work professionally in disability sport back in their home country, um, but I didn't as, as president. Uh, I mean, I had a full-time job as a, as a professor at university. Uh, by then I owned and was managing a sport medicine clinic. Uh, I was still carrying on other roles and responsibilities uh, in back, back home. I, I mean, I led the bid for the 2001 World Track and Field Championships, which I started back in 98. So uh, all of those things I was doing, as well as volunteering my time as president of IPC. But uh, I was fortunate to have the, the trust and support from the, from, our, from the dean of our faculty and the president of the university because they recognized and realized that, that my reputation uh, would, have an, uh, would have a reflection on the university as well. Yeah. So they didn't mind me you know, doing what I did, but it was also important for me to ensure that I didn't, um, that I didn't relax in my role as teacher uh, as a professor in my research and in attracting money for research, right. uh, which I didn't do. Uh, I mean, I won the top teaching award of the university a couple of years there. I made sure that the funding that I raised exceeded more than the rest of the staff combined. So I had to make sure I did as best a job as possible, if not better, because I didn't want to lend myself to criticism by other faculty members by thinking that all Stebra does is live in an airplane and is away all the time. Uh, so it was very, very, very difficult to balance the two. And of course, my girls at the time were, you know, were, well, were 12 and 14 years of age through to 
them getting married. So I missed a tremendous uh, amount of the most important aspects of their life, which uh, uh, I regret to this very day. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, as I started to fit in, or uh, I guess we hadn't yet opened our opened our headquarters, uh, but we were in the process uh, with the architect building it and, and that we started to look at hiring some staff. I wanted to hire a, uh, a chief executive officer. I wanted to hire someone uh, who would be in uh, communication to look after everything from our emails and our telephones and other requests from NPCs and media relations. So we had someone in, in that area. Um, I needed to, I felt it was important to have someone in information technology so that we could get computer systems and then someone involved in sport. So we had about five or six positions that we needed to get into position. But until I could start finding a way to um, raise more money through sponsorship and through the hosts of the organizing committees, it wasn't going to work because I couldn't continue to depend on the IOC for funding. I mean, they were very good and provided us with significant dollars. And then uh, I was able to get funding through a couple of sponsors. And then we started getting more money from the host organizing committees, which started in um, 96 in Atlanta and then Nagano and on from there. So we started getting some pretty good base money every two years to help put into uh, our uh, organization. Mm -hmm. But during those early years of our, uh, the development of the headquarters, I then had to develop again, a respectful, trustworthy relationship with the mayor of Bonn. Mm. And as a result of uh, the mayor's support in those early days, I mean, they donated the entire building to us. They renovated the entire building. They furnished the entire building and they absorbed all of our utilities. So we really had no costs in those early days with regards to the uh, headquarters. Not sure what it is today, but things have changed a lot. Right. So we were able to move fairly quickly in 98 going into 99 to hire uh, four or five staff members to uh, get hit the ground running with uh, technology, sport, administration, uh, and the like. So wow. I knew what I wanted. Uh, I knew what I needed to do to get there. It was just a matter of am I able to uh, achieve it? So again, this is kind of that late 90s time frame. And you also didn't mention that you were my graduate supervisor at this time. So that in and of itself was probably a massive load of stress on your shoulders. That, you know, you well, it, it was. I had a number of graduate, I think I had about seven graduate students, but uh, at the time, but uh, Six of them were very independent. They needed no supervision at all. Uh, but one was uh, constantly in my office. Uh, because a little more needy than the rest. Perhaps. Yeah, the, it was more. It was a little more challenging. Yeah, fair enough. So, I want to spend some time talking about the games of that time: Atlanta, Nagano, Sydney. Any any particular moments stand out to you as? Uh, important from a leadership perspective and how you uh, work with the host organizing committee or continue to move the Paralympic movement forward? Well, I think a, a couple or three things. Um, in Atlanta, I felt in some respects that I let the movement down and I failed uh, because we had so many problems uh, in, in Atlanta. Uh, ensuring that the games would go ahead and be successful. And again, because what had happened is that one committee that had been in place with previous games all of a sudden became right. two separate committees. 
And I think they knew full well that they could do with what they wanted to. And we just had to accept it because it was too far down the road, we couldn't change. So there were a lot of uh, organizational and administrative problems that happened there that that I really felt uh, uh, bad about. It was also at a time where where we were trying to be much more strict because we were attracting sponsors uh, that we were trying to be very restrictive on what the athletes and countries could use and couldn't use on their uniforms, on their equipment, etc. And uh, it it got so bad with wheelchair basketball, we darn near had to say, we're not gonna have wheelchair basketball because they didn't want to give up all of the ad, their personal advertising on the spokes of their wheelchairs. And, and yet that really was in conflict with the sponsor that we had. So, you know, there were things like that that were created that, uh, but again, it was, a gr it was growing pains because all of a sudden after the games, now we can be more strict, you know, but then they say, well, if we can't use those, are you going to give money back to us? Well, a lot of the money and the, and the services that we were providing to the countries, they were benefiting from the money that we were raising and running the movement. So sometimes they didn't look beyond the front of their glasses. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so they needed to be convinced that what we were doing, they were benefiting from. Right. Um, Nagano, uh, I thought, uh, went uh, very well. Uh, we, uh, it, it, be, it was because of such a different culture, there were different kinds of problems that we had to overcome, but they weren't difficult problems and they were so happy to have us there. They wanted to put on the very best games possible because they realized that 30, for 30, 34 years previous to that, they had the summer Paralympic Games there. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to do a great job. And, and the prefecture of Nagano and the governor of Nagano at the time was, was exceptionally good. Hmm. In fact, his executive assistant ended up getting more involved with the movement following the games. Uh, I mean, they were, whenever we ran into an issue that we didn't foresee and it was going to be awkward, we went to them, discussed it with them, they cooperated or we compromised a little bit, but it was, it was terrific. Uh, again, when we went to um, uh, Australia in 2000, that was quite a change uh, in in our movement. I mean, we had the modern Paralympics starting back in 88. Uh, we had the problems in 96 in Atlanta. Uh, so we had to really try to change things. They did in some respects, but we still had some issues uh, in Australia. Again, because of the fact that they, that they had one umbrella organization, but sort of two divisions. Mm -hmm. So it made it a little bit difficult when issues came up. And of course, some of the people involved were old school people and they just thought they were putting on another Stoke Mandeville game. So, so it wasn't easy. Uh, I guess uh, two or three fairly difficult situations that came up that I, had to handle with kid gloves was first of all was uh, it was at a time when our when our um, our athlete classification was getting much more strict and as a result there was actually uh, one of the better Australian athletes who was deemed ineligible mm. for competing at the games uh, because his disability was so minimal that uh, they felt that he had a distinct advantage and didn't uh, didn't qualify so of course being a local athlete it created huge uproar in the media the media were were uh, and and the, and as you well know david the australian media can be pretty uh, pretty cursed against a person and 
And uh, I got it from all sides, as did our medical officer, Dr. Riding at the time. But they appealed to the Court of Arbitration of Sport. We won that appeal. Uh, and uh, and the, the hatred that was going through the room where that took place was, was really bad. Mm. And the only, so I said, how can I, I felt so sorry for the athlete. Uh, I didn't so much for their organization, but the athlete I did. So what I did at the, after the end of the games, Australia was hosting a, a major celebration for their team their volunteers, their sponsors and the like. I was invited to that event and invited to the stage to speech, uh, to speak. And during my speech, I brought that athlete up on stage and presented him with a special uh, Paralympic medal, you know, and, and expressed to him my great sorrow that things did not work out for him better. Hmm. But again, you have to take care of those kinds of things and be sensitized to them. Hmm. And then I suppose a third thing, which was which was a bombshell, was when we found out that the uh, athletes on hmm. the uh, basketball team for Spain uh, were not mentally handicapped at all. And so their team had to lose a medal. And, uh, and we had to suspend not only the team, uh, but we ended up suspending the entire uh, mental handicap organization from the Paralympics. Uh, and that was, it. I think we handled it very, very well. Uh, and the first thing we did, we said, well, if they weren't, and they're from a, a very progressive country. So what happened there that they fell through the cracks? Something must be wrong with their classification system. So I had all of the classification forms for INUS FMH, and there weren't a lot of athletes, so it was only a matter of going through maybe 150 or 200 of the most athletes. And we found that that they were the forms were not even filled out and signed by qualified people. I would have thought that they would have used a, a clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist to determine the level of, of uh, capabilities of these individuals. But they were signed by moms and dads, a social worker, a principal, a school teacher, you know, everything except their barber. And uh, so it, it was very frustrating. So that was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back. That's when we had to say enough is enough. They will be suspended, expelled from our organization. And until the organization can grow and mature and find a, a system of handling the athletes to ensure that they are properly classified they cannot be part of the future of the Paralympic Games. Hmm. So that was that was Sydney. So two or three games like that in the over those uh, over those four years with three games, all very different kinds of experiences, hmm. but all very challenging experiences. So you had, you know, the the athlete who didn't qualify had we had doping problems. We had the classification problems, and yet still my greatest memory is sitting down in front of a room that was jam-packed with media, signing the Memorandum of Understanding with the International Olympic Committee with Samaranch. Mm -hmm. And so a year later, uh, in the early 2000s, you finished your three terms as president, and that was the maximum... Mm -hmm. terms allowed mm -hmm. so you step down as president you retire as a faculty member um talk, tell me about how that transition went from a leadership perspective mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. going from and again like i you know when you were my graduate supervisor how, how many days would you have been away a year oh my goodness i was likely away i want to say 200 but that 
Likely not quite that much, but 150, 175 days a year over, well, more than those 12 years, because there were years leading up to that where I was away trying to promote and market uh, a new structure and, and uh, organization as well. But you know, it's everyone goes through life experiencing discombobulations. Every leader does. And when I stepped down as president in December of 2001, uh, my retirement in November of 2001 uh, hit me like an icy wind. You know, all of a sudden, uh, by then, uh, all of my graduate students had finished their their degrees, uh, and I was standing in the middle of nowhere with nothing. You know, I said, what has happened to my life? I've got all these wonderful experiences. I've got situations where, where I was working seven days a week, uh, you know, every day, all day, somewhere in the world. And then all of a sudden, punk, it's gone. So that was just one of those discombobulations you had to deal with. It's an adversity in your life and you have to recognize that everyone has them. Every leader does. And it's, <clears throat> are you prepared to confront them, to handle those discombobulations and that adversity? And that's what I had to do. And and, you know, it was really highlighted to some degree before I finished my uh, term as president because my, as you remember, my retirement was was in November, a month before the uh, my finishing up as, as president. And so when I was there at the, at our, at my, at my retirement party, I mean, I was overwhelmed with the number of people that were there. I mean, we had a in an airplane hangar down in Fort Edmonton, and then there were five or six hundred people there. Everyone, I mean, even the lieutenant governor came, but not as the lieutenant governor. She came as Lois Hole and her husband. You know, so I mean, it was really uh, when I think back of it, I, the memories I had that night. Uh, uh, and the recollection of of thirty or forty years that just went through me in in the blink of an eye, and then and then the next month, of course, the end of the next month, going into um, into Greece for the uh, election, and you know, before that, David, in uh, I guess in ninety five uh, or ninety seven, pardon me. Uh, in Australia when we had the last elections for or the elections for the IPC there were some countries that brought forward a um, a proposal for a new they wanted to change the constitution and bylaws to allow people to be available to run for more than three terms. Mm. Um, and I spoke against it. I said, <clears throat> "You, I, I need to know why you want to change it. You can't change it for one or two people, for myself or someone else on the executive. You can change it for good reasons and principles that it's in the best interest of our organization, but don't change it for one person. Right. Because you could turn around the next time and want the next person to only have two terms or one term even. So they, so the, the, uh, uh, it was withdrawn from the floor. It was, it had been circulated. It had been put forward as a motion, um, mm -hmm. but it was withdrawn. So it wasn't even uh, decided on because it likely would have gone through, which mm -hmm. even to this day, I still think, uh, should not. Three four-year terms is more than enough for any organization to uh, to fulfill, you know, because you get worn out. You you know, I was I was hugely tired. I mean, I was 
exhausted, mentally exhausted for a long, long time after that uh, 12 years uh, was over. So it was, uh, it was, so I guess the 2001 General Assembly was a bit of a downer for me, not because of my leadership, not because of the years I put in, because we had made monumental accomplishments. I mean, we built the foundation for the organization. We increased it from 52 countries to 175 countries. We got sponsorship. We had a full, we had full-time staff. We had a, a beautiful building for our headquarters. Uh, the quality of the athlete performances increased. We we had an agreement. There were so many wins that we had mm -hmm. that everyone has to take away from that with some tremendous amount of pride. Yeah. Uh, and as I told everyone that, you know, no one ever, ever achieves anything on their own in this world. And as my good friend Claire Drake said, it's amazing what can be accomplished when no one cares who gets the credit as well. So, uh, but uh, I'm at, but Greece was a downer for me. It, uh, it was over and uh, the way it happened wasn't very good, but maybe in hindsight, that's the way it should have happened anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating to think that that was 20 years ago. Um, yes. 20 years you, ago. You continue to be a leader in, in a number of other capacities perhaps more locally, um, mm -hmm. but certainly, you know, as an example with our provincial sport and recreation collective for mm -hmm. uh, support for disability, yes. your leadership continuing with the Stedward Center at the yes. University of Alberta, um, et cetera. I, I want, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to kind of come to a bit of a conclusion of, of your story as it relates to leadership, but I don't want to overlook the last 20 years. Um, in your retirement from the University of Alberta as a faculty member and as you know, the president of the International Paralympic Committee. And so I'm hoping that maybe you can just share some thoughts and some comments on how your leadership has continued to evolve um, and just perhaps some, some thoughts on, you know, looking back on a career of, you know, 40, 50, 60 years mm -hmm. uh, professionally. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, we can, we can go through the accolades, the, you know, the honorary um, commendations, the awards, and just the number of organizations that you were a founder of or, sure. you know, or helped, sure. helped create. But I'm just looking for you to kind of try to summarize, the, you know, your leadership evolution in the last 20 years since your retirement and perhaps trying to make some final thoughts yeah. on your reflection of leadership. Sure. Well, I think a number of things come to mind, uh, David. Uh, first of all, I was very blessed to have some unbelievable mentors in my life that helped develop the characteristics in me that I wanted to have to help me to become a leader and the leader that I was or is. Um, and some of those people that mentored me didn't know they were mentoring me. It was because I was observing these leaders and trying to find out why are they successful as leaders? What are some of their skills that they have uh, that I could try to emulate or develop? Uh, and a lot of these people, um, I got to know a little bit or a lot. And you learn from their skills and characteristics and and uh, not only emulate them, but they're successful because of this. Can I take that into my repertoire to help me? You know, and it doesn't matter whether it was uh, Nelson Mandela or whether it was the Ayatollah Khomeini from Iran, whether it was some of the royalty that I met over the years uh, in uh, in Japan or China, didn't matter. They had they had special skills and characteristics that I wanted to emulate, which I tried to do throughout my life. And then I really felt it was my responsibility to further uh, insert that into people 
that I could influence so that they would become leaders that uh, that I would be proud of too because um, you're just you don't you're not born a leader uh, I don't believe you can learn to be a leader uh, but some people just have the the ambition the desire uh, the drive the compassion uh, and all of those things to become a good leader but you have to work at it you have to you have to have people open doors for you. You have to have people that will mentor you. Uh, you ha you have to be prepared to um, to be open minded and and to be prepared to learn what you need to learn to be an effective leader. And as I always say, that's where the relationship building, the trust, responsibility, integrity, and all of those compassionate kinds of adjectives are are there and present. So even when I retired in 2001, I wanted to continue doing something, but maybe a little bit different from what I was involved with. I mean, I, I did stay involved somewhat with the IOC and IPC for a couple of years, but not in any leadership capacities. Uh, but I got involved in working back with athletes. Um, I was right. mentoring and managed the lives of David Peltier and Jamie Soleil. And I was their life coach. I didn't look at myself as their, as their manager. I didn't look at them uh, in, in that and because I looked after everything about them. I met met with them and worked with them as their counselor, their consultant. I did their banking, their investments. I dealt with every aspect of their life. And I always felt that that's where a lot of people who are agents fail athletes because they don't prepare them for life. They don't prepare them for retirement. They're basically interested in being paid for the work that they're doing for them. And I said, I would never, ever do that. Uh, I then, after Jamie Slay and David Peltier, I started to get involved to a smaller degree with, you know, with people like Jennifer Heil and that, but, uh, but I couldn't get involved with her to the degree I would have loved to because I was so involved with Jamie and David. And you can't, you can't be all things. I wasn't going to be an agent where you've got, you know, a litany of, of athletes you're working with. Uh, and then when David and Jamie started tapering down, then I moved into uh, managing uh, the career of a musician, a, a singer, an entertainer. Right. So those kinds of opportunities started. And rodeo. Uh, rodeo. Uh, rodeo, a number of cowboys that I had worked with over the years. So a number of those um, opportunities came my way because in most situations they sought me out more than I sought them out. Uh, you know, Beck, you know, the Becky Scotts of the world and the Jennifer Hiles, they contacted me to, you know, uh, in areas like that. But, and I, and I would dearly wished I would have been able to have the time to spend more time with them. But I also thought I had to spend a little more time with myself and my family too. Yeah. You know, because of the years of uh, the 15, 20 years of neglect that was there as well. So, so that well, was by this point, you were a grandfather with multiple grandchildren. Yes, yes, so for sure. Yeah. Created, you created that place south of Edmonton. Mm -hmm. And I remember you were always going with your granddaughter to, seems to me, lacrosse events and the States or wherever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really, I've got as involved as much as I could with my grandchildren, and I've certainly learned by my involvement with my four grandkids how much I missed mm -hmm. of my two daughters growing up. And uh, so my grandkids likely think I smother them, but, but uh, you know, my two grandsons, I was always at their hockey games as much as possible. They both played uh, handball, European handball, team handball and were excellent because they were on the provincial team that traveled internationally from places like uh, Serbia and 
Norway and Japan. They had great experiences. And then traveling with my youngest granddaughter into the U.S. Uh, for her lacrosse tournaments. And now she's signed a, a very prestigious NC2A lacrosse scholarship in South uh, Carolina. So, you know, they've all done well. They're all still doing well. And, uh, and they've become a, a really important and special place uh, in my life. Awesome. I, the, the, my final question. Um, so, you know, part of, part of the reason for this, these interviews is leading towards the writing of a chapter for a book. And, and who knows, I, I think there might be an opportunity to load these online for, for people um, just to hear from your own voice and your own perspective, your thoughts on leadership, particularly within a Paralympic context. But mm -hmm. if you, if you could, you know, pr provide some concluding comments again for a, an undergraduate student in health and physical education, kinesiology and sport on how to become a better leader. What would your advice be? Well, you know, uh, you have to have a certain amount of creativity, interest, and a bit of a dream to begin with. If you have an interest in becoming a leader, no matter what that looks like, you can do it. No matter who you are, sit in your classroom, look around the room. Every one of you can become leaders in your own way. Some of you may be, become leaders of your family. Some of you may become politicians. Some of you may become outstanding teachers and grow from there to become leaders. But you have to set your goals. You have to set your mind. You have to set your dream in front of you and then begin to chase it. You've got to work towards that dream. It's not to say that it may change that dream of becoming a leader here, here, or here, but you have to intentionally want to become a leader. You, it's not good enough to just go to class, do your papers, do your exam, get on with life, you know, no, that's not good enough. You're going to learn a certain amount what you do in classes, but you have to be prepared to volunteer. You have to be prepared to work part time in, in, in areas that you may not like or you may not want as a avocation or vocation or professionally, but you need to get involved. I developed my leadership skills and I got involved in leadership because of the opportunities that I took advantage of. And the first thing was volunteering and also to have some fundamental building blocks that were that were developed in you by your parents, your grandparents, your friends, your relatives, your teachers, your professors. All of these people are helping you develop your skills. But you have to be prepared to take advantage of them. If you don't, you won't make it as the leader you would like to be. Dr. Sedward, I, I have thoroughly, if nothing else, this doesn't translate into anything. Um, I've really enjoyed these four sessions, getting to know you a bit better. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just been fun four hours just talk, just talking to you. Yeah. So thank you. Thanks for well, you're welcome. Uh, you know, I've I've en I've enjoyed it, and and what it has done, it's allowed me to reflect and to think back to those <clears throat> early days growing up in Saskatchewan and. You know, and with the recent death of a good friend, thinking of the impact that him and his father made on me in my little town of Eston in Saskatchewan. It's, uh, it's given me an opportunity to reflect all the experiences I've had along uh, my life. Uh, I mean, getting an opportunity to leave Eston and going to Regina and get that opportunity to do sport at a much higher level, mm -hmm. you know, and... Uh, 
little things, uh, you know, like that. Uh, I mean, we had a big reunion for our, my class, 55 years or 60 years or whatever it was. And uh, one guy sent me an article cut out of the leader post from 1964, you know, uh, Stedward having a jump off and triple jump with Ron Cram. I mean, that just kind of brought it back like it was yesterday. I mean, here's a six foot two who eventually became a <laughs> professional football player and an outstanding athlete against a five foot six at nothing <laughs> in, a, in a triple jump at the provincial track. But I beat him, you know. <laughs> Why? Because you dug down deeper and people didn't think you could do it, but you can if you set your mind to it. You know, size and this and that is only is only part of it. Hmm. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna stop recording now and then we'll finish up.